Well, welcome to the Monday, March 18th, 2024, regular council meeting for Village Council. Uh, this meeting is called to order. Judy, if you could call the roll. Indeed. Stokes. I'm here. DeVore Leonard. Here. Housh. Here. Gustafson. Here. Also present is Village Manager Johnny Burns. Solicitor Amy Blankenship. And we are expecting Councilperson Carmen Brown. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, we're going to start off with some swearings in for the Public Arts and Culture Commission um, before we move on to announcements. So, you all, if you don't mind standing up, I, um, I'm going to give you all the choice whether you want to be sworn in together or individually. What do you say? No, let's do it together okay. because we're in this together. <laughs> Come on over so you're center stage. Oh, okay. All right, Re recognize on it? Okay. okay. All right, if you could raise your right hand. I solemnly affirm. Thank you. I like you see it in the I love it. <laughs> that I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. And will obey the laws of the United States. And will obey the laws of the United States. And of the state of Ohio. And of the state of Ohio. That I will in all respects. That I will in all respects. Observe the provisions of the charter. And observe the provisions of the charter. And ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. And ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of. Public Arts and Culture Commission. All right. Well, welcome. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Nice haircut. Thank you. All right. You are officially part of village government. Whoa. Be warned. Okay. That's okay. We know. Thank you. Thanks very much. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm stating to you officially that you do not have to remain unless you really want to. You mean I can leave? <laughs> oh, wait a second. I think that's what she just said. <laughs> yeah, that's what she was talking about. We have lots of fun things that happen at our meetings, so yeah, feel free to stay. Absolutely. Um, Ryan, Kevin, look, do you want to talk about uh, voting I, tomorrow, or well, that's usually one that's of your, that's like, my thing. But I'm going to so. begin. I'm going to be begin announcements uh, with a with a, a written statement, um, and I'll just read this for the most part. Um, this is to everyone who's interested. As you are likely aware. Uh, by this point, there were two interrelated criminal incidents in the village. The first was on Thursday, March 14th, and the second was yesterday, Sunday, March 17th. I have been authorized to assure the public that these two incidents were related and the same individual is the person of interest in both incidents. That individual is now in custody. I am fully aware of concerns that have been raised uh, regarding communication to the public as the inv investigation unfolded. Uh, the safety of our residents was the first priority of both Yellow Springs Police Department and of the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation. And this is sort of a personal statement, just saying that it would be a disservice to the integrity of our police department and the many responding agencies who assisted if we were to let our frustration regarding the timing of communication obscure the outstanding work and the positive outcome regarding the apprehension of a suspect in this difficult set of cases. Finally, I would like to extend my deepest sympathies to all those who have been impacted by the incidents on uh, March 14th and 17th. And um, for, for multiple reasons, we have been wanting to encourage um, folks to sign up for our messaging system, for the HyperReach system. Um, 
that we understood that there were some uh, portions of the community who who, who hadn't uh, felt that they may reach out to, uh, I believe the folks at the college, uh, uh, maybe express some concern, but we will share uh, this information. So if you go um, to wiso.com, our village website, you will easily find um, uh, a link to where you can sign up so you can uh, be uh, more easily informed uh, about all things uh, regarding biz uh, any emergency issues or any other urgent issues. I, I think we, we found out uh, just a few weeks ago when we had the storms uh, that this is a valuable tool and it was very helpful uh, certainly in this this uh, past weekend as well but we do want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to be uh, signed up so you can be be reached uh, when when needed um, I would imagine that uh, maybe my colleagues uh, may want to share uh, uh, some some thoughts maybe regarding um, the statement, either the statement or the the message, if you will. But I would um, caution all of us um, that there is an ongoing investigation. I hope you all um, viewed the press conference earlier, and so you got a feel for uh, what things uh, we we're able to talk about and, and the things that we've been uh, cautioned against for general purposes. Um, so I would, again, just for those of my council colleagues that uh, would like to share, I'm gonna open the floor at this time. Okay. Um, I think the only thing I'll say, um, because you know, certainly we will have citizen concerns if you know, folks wanna <coughs> speak about this, but um, I will say uh, I appreciate uh, that Kevin brought up, you know, the press conference, which I thought was really great. Um, what's promising for me is that when we have the opportunity to answer some of the questions about concerns around communications, we will certainly do that. I mean, I, you know, we're not going to avoid like any of those, like, uh, I guess, you know, questions to your local government about how we, you know, are communicating on these issues, but um, I think it's pretty clear that we have some, uh, this has been like a, an area where we've had to be careful about how we move forward, and so anyway, but we will be addressing those issues when we can. Yep. So, yep. Absolutely. And Brian, thank you for uh, those comments and also for the <laughs> the voting intro introduction. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm moving on to voting on yes, the premise. I didn't see anything else. I mean, it's tomorrow. Yeah. Yep. I just have one thing to say. I just want to yep. express um, my deepest condolences to the family and friends of everybody involved on both sides of this tragic situation that happened in our small village. Yep. Thank you, Trish. Appreciate that. Um, in, in voting, this is, um, you know, we, we, we spoke a little bit about um, voting at our last meeting. I would just encourage, as, as we've done in the past, encourage folks to be informed um, uh, about issues. It's, it's, and, and I um, uh, touched on a few of those things in uh, the letter that I submitted to, to the news. Um, and again, because of those circumstances with our primary, uh, I would submit that most of us, myself included, would, would tend to just grab a Democratic uh, ballot and have at it. You know, but but I acknowledge that there's some things that we have an opportunity to impact, you know, at the county level and at the regional level, um, and then for if we want to have a say about who's in those offices, the way our primary is, you have to grab, I would have to grab a Republican uh, ballot. Um, so again, I just again want to encourage folks to to study, have a plan. You know, that's the common statement is have a plan for voting. And in this case, I would submit not just planning when and how you get to the polls, but, but you study which if ballot and which choices that could be made on the ballot are gonna serve your, your interests better. Okay, um, are there any other announcements? I just wanted to uh, send our condolences to uh, uh, 
Kanetta Sanford, a former council member, uh, her father, Greg Sanford, who uh, was a big part of Yellow Springs, involved in Brene and whatnot, um, recently passed. And uh, there are, uh, you know, you can get online with uh, Yellow Springs News if uh, you want to uh, participate in the uh, services on Friday, but uh, but I did want to mention that, uh, yeah, we're thinking about Canada. So. Thanks, Brian. I, I appreciate that. All right. Seeing uh, no other announcements, we're going to move on to our consent agenda. Uh, we have a couple of items in the consent, consent agenda. They're the minutes of our last meeting on March 4th, um, 2024, and also the credit card statement that's in the packet. Uh, regarding the minutes of March 4th, uh, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. All right. Um, any discussion uh, regarding the March 4th, 2024 meeting minutes? All right, hearing none, I will, uh, all, those, uh, all those in favor of approving these minutes, uh, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All right, thank you. Um, next, we have the credit card statement. It's in our packet. Uh, can I get a motion to discuss this as well? So moved. Second. All right, uh, any comments, concerns, questions? Uh, regarding the credit card statement. Okay, thank you. All in favor of approving that statement, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All right, uh, the motion is passed. Oops. All righty. Um, next, we have review of the agenda. This is where we, uh, as council, have an opportunity to um, look over the existing agenda, uh, make any changes by adding items to that agenda or removing items. Uh, do we have any uh, modifications to the agenda. All right, hearing none, uh, we are moving on. Uh, we will follow the agenda as um, has been published. All right, uh, petitions and communications. Uh, Gavin, if you would, please. Yeah, um, we received the mayor's clerk uh, information with their monthly report, and then um, the flyer for the water documentary that um, Johnny had mentioned previously that uh, Yellow Springs has a little piece of. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Gavin. And, and Johnny, if you could um, remind us when, I know, I, I believe that there's going to be the, the documenta documentary is going to be shown at the Little Art Theater. It will be March 20th at 5 o'clock. Okay, March 20th at 5 o'clock, and I think I have that in my, in my calendar. Try to look back at Ben and make sure I told you to say. <laughs> so, or if you want to, you know, venture down to Dayton, you can do it on the 24th as well. Correct. So, at the Neon. Of course, we'd, yes, but we'd rather everyone attend in Yellow Springs. So. Indeed, at our own Little Art Theater. A great place to watch a movie together. I think I got it right. <laughs> it's been a while. Alrighty. Um, thank you again for all of that. Uh, on to our legislation. Uh, Judy, if you could please uh, read resolution 2024-25 uh, by title only. This is authorizing payment of invoices with a then announced certificate for the first quarter of 2024. Wait, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. All right, good. Motion in uh, second. Uh, Johnny, are you going to this? This is me. This is a uh, miscommunication um, on a PO for a truck repair. Uh, they asked me. I forgot. Uh, I have to be able to split the lines for that particular truck. We got the invoice before I got the PO in, but the truck is repaired, and uh, we just need authorization to be able to pay it. <laughs> All right. Great. Any uh Questions or comments from council? All right, hearing none. All in favor of this piece of legislation, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All right, uh, motion is passed. Judy, if you would please read resolution 2024 26 by title only. This is approving check signing privileges for West Banco Bank general checking and guaranteed deposits. All right, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. 
Johnny, I this feel like this is got you. me again. And, and you get uh, to slip in a I get pseudo, to slide in yeah. the reason why. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, authorizing uh, Michelle to be put, Michelle Robertson to be put on the check signing. She was AP and payroll uh, person, so she didn't need to be on the check signing. She has since then uh, accepted the finance director's position. Uh, so we need her to be able to sign checks to be able to uh, fulfill that job. Excellent, excellent, great. Um, thank you for that, Johnny. Any questions uh, from council? All right, all in favor, uh, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All right, thank you, the motion is passed. Now to resolution 2024-27. Judy, if you could read that by title only. This is approving the final plan for Green County Countywide 911 system. Thank you, can I get a motion please? So moved. Second. All right, thank you all. Uh, Johnny, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look to you unless, hey. oh, all right. Hey, Amy. Amy. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, so this is part of the Next Generation 911. We've talked about this in here a little bit. It was a part of the budget bill last fall. The um, Green County Plan Review Committee has, we this, this board approved um, a representative to that committee. I don't remember off the top of my head who it was. It was someone from Jamestown. Jamestown. Yes. And so that committee has now done their work. They've put together this final plan, which is required by the state law for them to do. And then every jurisdiction within the county needs to um, approve or disapprove approve of the plan. So we had a chance earlier today to have some conversations with the chief about it. If you've got some questions about the plan between all of us, I think we'll be able to field them. Um, but this doesn't change a whole lot for the village. It um, really just checks a box under the, the new statutes that the state's put in place for the uh, next gen 911. All right. Council, do uh, you have questions for either Johnny or our solicitor, Amy? Nope. All right. Thank you, Amy, for your input. Council, all those in favor of approving this resolution, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, hearing none, the motion is passed. Now we're to citizen concerns. Um, this is the part of the meeting where um, anyone, uh, citizens as well as council, um, uh, you're allowed to step up to the podium if you'd like. Uh, the typical uh, rule is that we uh, allow three minutes for your comments. Um, so um, if anyone wants to come up, identify yourself and your affiliation with the village, now is the time to do so. Pan, I, I saw Pan, thank you. Thank you for listening. My name is Pan Reich. Uh, I've lived here in the village for a couple of decades, volunteered for the fire department as a paramedic for 12 or 15 years. Um, most of you know I'm a registered nurse, worked in the emergency trauma center for 17 years, night shift charge nurse for half of that. Uh, so I've had a lot of contact with police. Before I was a nurse, my bachelor of science degree from UD is in criminal justice. And they sent me to the police academy and I worked at Jefferson Township as an officer on West Dayton. So I have some background and know a few things about law enforcement, although that's been a long time to pass. I'm here to share that um, I, my wife, and many villagers have felt that there was two lapsed in judgments that put many of us at unnecessary risk to our lives. And based upon the statement that you've made and the news conference today, it seems like those are not being recognized. On Thursday, there was a shooting and our police chief, um, Chief Page, made the decision uh, that there was no further risk to the community. Three days later, it was proven that that judgment of hers was an error because the gunman came back to Yellow Springs and threatened somebody with a gun to their face, the same person. It would have done nothing to hinder her investigation if she had let us know that there was a gunman at large. We can't tell you who the victim was or who the gunman was, but you need to still have caution. Because during that three days time, we were walking our dog down that street. Uh, our doors were not locked except when we go to bed. You know, we weren't in any kind of caution at all. And we should have been. She owed us that. 
when uh, she had the, the press conference, she said, well, you know, hindsight's 2020 and shrugged her shoulders. You know what? She made a mistake, an error in judgment, and she owes us an apology, and she needs to not make that mistake again. But the blatant lapse in judgment is what happened last night. At 6.30, this man came back and stuck his gun in someone's face, and they called 911 immediately. Paige knew this right away, 6.30. She didn't tell any of us until 9.45, three hours and 15 minutes later. During that period of time, my wife is in our yard. We have friends who are walking their dog down that street. I live on West South College Street, where that happened. We didn't know anything because of uh, the, the city, the village. We found out because neighbors were letting us know because other neighbors were telling people. And the statement that I heard that uh, we didn't put out the BOLO alert until 945 because we were swamped with two to 300 phone calls, no, that is inaccurate. Because you did not put out a BOLO soon enough, that's why you got the two to 300 phone calls. If you put out the emergency alert to all the phones that we have and put it on the Yellow Springs bulletin board, she may, all those phone calls, or a majority of them, would never have happened. You know, our, our neighbor said, somebody's got a gun right down on your street. Like, what should, should we, what should we be doing? You know, okay, that was a colossal, minutes. colossal uh, uh, lapse in judgment. Three hours and 15 minutes, and I suspect there would have been no bolo if we hadn't been calling dispatch. I think she put off that bolo to get us to stop calling. 10, 15 minutes after she found this out is when we should have been known to turn our lights on, lock our doors, stay out of the yard, don't walk down the street. If somebody had been shot and killed by that guy, do you think this village would not be sued for millions of dollars for the lapse in judgment and not letting us know the information that she had? You know, when, when Josue hired her... Okay, we're getting to four minutes, I'm sure. When Josue like hired, hired her, there was a very impressive black gentleman from Mississippi with decades of experience in police supervision. Paige's only experience before coming here was doing catching shoplifters for uh, a department store. I think she was a great police officer. She was very sensitive, she was kind. I think she's an asset to the village. But to pop her into the position of chief to make these kind of decisions that will keep us safe, I really felt she was lacking experience. And this has proved that. This is not something that needs to be sweeped away. This is something that needs to be corrected. We have the emergency call system, use it. Her primary responsibility is to keep us safe. And she failed in that, usually one time, and the, the, the judgment she made that there was no risk, it sounds like BCI agreed with that, so I can kind of accept that. But what happened Sunday night, I'm sorry, three and a half, three hours and 15 minutes of not letting us know that our lives were literally in risk from a man walking around with a gun putting in people's faces, no. That needs to be corrected, and we need an apology from her and a statement from her saying that she will not make that mistake again. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Art, I think I recognize you next. <coughs> Art Boulay, uh, Villager. Um, thank you for letting me speak this evening. Uh, I think most importantly, we lost a uh, Villager last week. Uh, I know I grieve for them, and as many of you expressed as well. Um, less importantly, but more pertinent, uh, whoever was responsible for the communication or uh, the complete and utter lack of communication to village residents regarding the homicide last week, uh, whoever was, was responsible for that has failed spectacularly. Um, our village website reads that trust is earned through consistent, meaningful engagement with our community and that transparency is crucial for external relations, and that is true. What it doesn't say, but which is just as true, is that trust is also erased when meaningful engagement turns into silence and when transparency is replaced by concealment. My trust has been completely effaced. I'm no longer confident in the safety of my family, my friends, my neighbors, or my coworkers who I am responsible to provide a safe working place for. 
The lack of confidence finds its origin in the failure to timely communicate to village residents what occurred last week, the ongoing ramifications and potential concerns for villagers, and the severity of the issue. This past weekend I did a lot of things around the village with my family and I did all those things based on the fundamental premise that there was not a suspect who just committed homicide at large in my community. I came to find out late on Sunday evening that that was not the case. What I want to ask is this, do we as villagers have any reasonable expectation that we are safe and that if that safety is jeopardized, do we have a reasonable expectation that we will be notified? Because if past behavior truly is the best predictor of future performance, then there's no compelling reason why any villager would have the expectation that they are safe or that they will be notified if that safety is put into jeopardy. Thank you. I'm sorry, can I get your name again? I did not get it. My name's Art Boulet, A-R-T-B-O-U-L-E-T. Jeff Campbell, villager. I, uh, I've been here for a long time, 60-some years. I second what both of these gentlemen are saying. That was a total inept, totally inept response that our police department gave in this town. When that happened on Saturday night, they had an idea who this person was. They probably had an idea of where this guy was, too. And for the fact that we went 48 hours without anybody knowing anything in this town, and I mean nothing. I was getting notified by my boss at work before I got notified by anybody else concerning this entire matter. And it is to totally, she was totally inept in doing her job, 100%. And on top of the fact, when you had a cop call a Signal 99 and you had cops from all over this area streaming in here like it was a almost an, a mass casualty attack was totally wrong also. That cop should never have called a, a Signal 99 because when he showed up at that scene, that woman was dead behind that door. And he had no reason to call a, a Signal 99 because he was the only cop on duty, which you better probably start looking at too. You need more cops in this town because obviously that proved it, that that cop didn't have any backup whatsoever in this town to rely on at all. And you guys really need to take a look at this because budget or not, you need to be taking a look at the fact that we need more cops on this street because if this start, stuff starts happening in this town, you're gonna have more problems than you wish you ever dreamt of. But you gotta really take a look at this because this is just an opening solve of things. And you know it as well as I do. But the way things are going in this country, it ain't gonna get any better anytime soon. You guys really need to take a look at this. But the ineptitude on this was just 100%, 100% on the police department. And they totally blew it, 100%. So and I've talked to a lot of people, and they're, they, you have a lot of people out there that feel the same way about this. Thank you. Uh, are, are you a resident? Yes, I am. Well, I'm being taxed like a resident. I don't live here. I lived here for 60 years. I work here. And so your affiliation with the village? I pay taxes okay. to this village every year. Okay. I grew up here. I've lived here for 65 years. All right. No, I appreciate the comments. Just wanted to get the context. You know, a lot of residents. I'm going to take a different tact on this. We know BCI was involved with this, and that hasn't been mentioned. BCI runs the program, they run the investigation. It's under their realm. Um, we've seen other two other homicides that have happened here with Skip, with Skip Brown and, and Sherry Mendenhall, and also with Lanya. Ten days it took for that first crime to be to to apprehend the two gentlemen down in, in Xenia. They were even at the at the wake of skips, so we weren't safe then. There were, and that wasn't an issue, though we all knew that this was going on. There was an active there was an active murder going on. Lanya was three months before anything happened. So let's put things in perspective. When BCI comes in here, they run the show. We don't. We're a small village as opposed to the big city, the Columbus, the Cincinnati, the Cleveland. We don't have those resources. When BCI comes in, they're going to run the show their way. Whether we like it or not, that's what we all have to understand, too. There are two sides to this, and please understand if there is the other side that we haven't talked about is with, with BCI, with running the investigation. They're going to run it to their best benefit to see what they've got to do to get to the bottom line. And it took them four days. Whether we agree with it or not, we got to an end result, which is, which is good. And we are safe as a village, though we have lost we have lost life here. Um, 
Lastly, social media. I see a lot of stuffs coming. I, I'm not a social media person. I don't go. I, I don't go on it. I've already seen and already seen the effects of it that has come through with text threads and what's coming at Chief Burge. I, I I wish you would just think before you before you send these texts or you send these messages, um, and put yourself in their position. We all think we know better with hindsight's 2020, but put yourself in their position and choose your words wisely. You're not here to defeat and demoralize some of you. We're supposed to come together as a village, so let's come together as a village and move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dino. Scott Osterholm, I'm a resident, work here. Um, what Dino was in, I also want to second that one. Um, I know BCI was involved in this, and initially when the uh, press conference was announced, there was supposed to be part of it. Um, did they pull out? I mean, did they just leave our police department to hang for this? Because maybe the mistakes were made by the BCI, and our cops had to go along with it. We don't know. Mistakes were made. And since I live on West Center College, um, the one thing I am upset about is the three-hour delay Sunday night. That, and a lot of villagers are really concerned about that one, and I have to go along with them. That, that's, that's, a, that's a punt. I mean, that wasn't good. Because um, that happened at 6.15, I didn't hear anything until after 9. And uh, luckily it wasn't warm weather and I was out riding my bike. Because I ride, I ride down South College all the time. Um, but that's sort of all I got to say. I'm not here to praise Caesar nor bury Caesar, but those two issues I really think are where we need to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> I'm scanning the room, not seeing any indication of Emily. You're moving. <laughs> Not seeing any indication of anyone uh, want to uh, indicate uh, that they want to, to stand up. So we are, unless someone wants to come, uh, we're going to go ahead and close out our citizen concerns. So, can I, yeah, just I guess I just want to reiterate what was said in the initial statement um, that you read. Just the idea that um, these these pieces of feedback are heard. Um, and I think just like we talked about recently doing a um, sort of review of how things went after the storm, there's been a lot of major issues happening here in the village the last several weeks um, that I think there's no, I, I have no reason to believe there won't be a serious look at how things are handled and then communicate back appropriately. Um, so I just want to say that I uh, appreciate folks um, sharing their feedback um, and that it's heard. Great. Thanks, Kevin. All right, again, seeing no indication of any other um, desire to speak. Uh, thank you again for everyone. Um, wow, Emily, you're on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Emily Seibel is here to give us the Home Inc. annual report. Thank you. It's part of our special reports. Yes. <laughs> Just want to, like, take a deep breath. Yeah. After that, it's sometimes the room is so intense here. But, um, I'm Emily Seibel, the executive director of Yellow Springs Home Inc. And I just like to acknowledge, kind of like Gavin did, you know, just anytime our community's hurting, just taking a deep breath and sitting with that a little bit. So, um, you know, the Yellow Springs Home Inc. mission and how we're, we're how we were created and formed is really a mission of healing and working towards a unified whole and unbroken community. And so um, I'm excited to share with you this evening uh, some of the accomplishments from 2023 as well as looking to the future. So are you doing the scrolling, Judy? Okay. <laughs> So I'm not going to spend very much time on the slides because you have already seen them. And if you haven't seen them, they're in your packet for anyone in the community too would like to, to look at it. Um, so a highlight from this slide is just thank you. Thank you for being affordable housing champions. Thank you for investing strategically. And I think the results speak for themselves in terms of the return on investment um, and the ability of 
your dollars to leverage significant outside funding that we in turn then get to, to put back into Yellow Springs. So, um, you know, get, waive tap fees and 40,000 in funding for phase one, help to leverage $2.29 million in economic development. Your $12,000 match for the USDA Housing Preservation Grant, which was a 5% match, helped to leverage nearly half of the funds in the whole state uh, in the year that we applied, which was $200,000 that we then got to pass along to residents, homeowners of low income in the community for major health and safety repairs. Um, I think this is just a snapshot of the 80 plus residents currently living in Yellow Springs home ink housing who are part of our community land trust. Um, and that includes more than 25 children. I think the Yellow Springs home ink residents, uh, it's clear are woven into the fabric of our community. They are our uh, local employees, small business owners, parents, volunteers, and so much more. So we just like to always center our work in the clients. And then I update this slide for you every year and it gets, it's harder um, to share with you every year. I really mean that, it's, it's, it's kind of makes me sick to put this together. But uh, this is the growing and urgent uh, Yellow Springs affordability gap for a family of three at 80% of area median income, which represents the 40% of the population. Um, our housing market currently, you have to be, it, it cuts out almost 75% of the uh, lowest income earners, so the top 25% can actually access our community. And so I think affordable housing isn't just about helping one family, one family, one family, or removing a barrier to opportunity. It's also about what kind of community we wanna be moving forward um, and recognizing that we're really stronger through making sure that we have economic inclusion. And just to, just to state that number again, the affordability gap for a single family household as of last year's median home sale price and current interest rates, even with great credit, uh, was over $180,000 per, per home. If you were, that's, that's the gap between someone of low to moderate income and, and what you could afford in the current housing market. And every year that gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, okay. So then I think this is just a quick overview of the community land trust, um, trust being the key word, um, and just that, that it's a proven model and showing the different ways that it works. We can keep with it going. And here is our mission. We also have a DEI uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion statement on our website, and I'd really encourage everybody to read it. Um, it's really centered in shared governance and continual uh, reflection and learning on this path. And then these were our strategic goals. We just finished our five-year strategic plan, and so we're now thinking about the, the next five and 25 years since we just celebrated turning 25. Um, so our, our mission is really about building prosperity for the whole community. Um, I just want to point out a couple of highlights. So first is the portfolio of affordable housing in the land trust is generating over $100,000 a year. And most of that money is going to support our public schools as well as local infrastructure um, and all of the other ways that property taxes are um, making Yellow Springs uh, more prosperous. We've also provided for more than $7 million in economic development and that's really community driven economic development. Um, and we have 40 homes and counting. And then this is an overview of our client and community first programs. We currently serve more than 75 households per year. Um, this is the less visible but really important part of our mission and so we accomplish that through all of these different uh, programs that we've been administering and steadily growing since we formalized the program. And then the two things I really want to point out here are that we now have over 300 households on our rental interest list and we get calls every week, multiple calls every week um, and people are desperate to have options for rental housing within reach. Um, 
and it's it's just becoming clear that it's that that's only growing that need is growing that demand is growing over time um, they're just very limited options for people and so they either have to they have very little choice um, there are also um, some quality issues and then there are people who are being displaced regularly um, and then we also got more than 60 home ownership applications last year so there's a real robust interest in that in our home ownership program as well one thing I, I would say to the community, anybody watching this, is that if you're interested in uh, buying a home, uh, we have both the Yellow Springs Home Inc. Affordable Housing Program, which is always, it's always a good time to sign up for that um, because you don't want to wait um, until you're 100% ready to get started on the process because we will do one-on-one -on -one financial coaching. And then we also have low interest mortgages that we package in-house. We're one of the only certified packagers with USDA. Um, and those interest rates are as low as 1% over a 33-year period. So you can, you can get out a mortgage calculator and compare that, but that's hundreds of dollars a month um, in savings. So I also wanted to do a housing preservation grant report. Um, this was our first time applying for this program. And you, we came to you, and I think we had like, what, two weeks to turn this application around after the, we found out about it. And you took a leap of faith and put some really early money in, and it really paid off. So uh, because of your $12,000 contribution, we were able to serve uh, seven households of low income in Yellow Springs with really important home repair projects. And these included things like new roofs, a carport for increased accessibility and safety, uh, new replacement siding and re weatherization, um, HVAC replacement, a new hot water heater, <laughs> flooring, electrical issues, and a whole lot of other stuff. So here's a little handwritten note from Carlos uh, Landaboro. You may know him. He's been around town for a long time, but uh, he was one of the program recipients. And then on the next slide, we have another little note from Jim Zayner. Is that, am I saying his last name right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I'll just read this one, because I mean, this is, this is a thank you to, to you as a village for investing in this too. So uh, my COPD would be unbearable this summer without getting air conditioning. Breathing is a whole lot easier and good flows both ways. My partner Carl and I are in the process of putting together a soup kitchen in Yellow Springs. As village legend Gabby Mason said, it's nice to be nice, try it. That, that last part touched my heart, so we <laughs> keep going. Um, and then, I think this is less visible, but since 2019, the Inclusive and Resilient Yellow Springs Coalition um, has been meeting, um, sometimes bi-weekly. Kevin Stokes is representing the village of Yellow Springs on it. Um, here's our mission, and you can see the primary affiliations. Next slide, please, Judy. <laughs> And then here are some of the current coalition-driven projects. So we sometimes we support <coughs> projects that are existing and, and weigh in on them, um, lend advice and input. But we also have some a few projects that we're really pushing and championing. Um, and so you can see them summarized here. Um, I also want to just do a shout out for a save the date community conversation affordability part one. And that will be place, taking place on Thursday, April 11th at seven o'clock at the Yellow Springs Senior Center Great Room. And um, I know Len Kramer is here to talk about the, the same thing. So you'll hear from him right after me. <laughs> um, we need to keep going. And then this is our next project. And we can go through these slides really pretty quickly. <laughs> project <Yeah>. history. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> you can see we've been working on this for a very long time. Um, but, and actually, before, yeah, before 2012, there were, was probably a decade of work that other organizations put in. So this is a really long time coming. Um, we had a lot of public input over a lot of years, <laughs> and so I, am, I feel uh, like the project is really reflecting what people um, 
are looking for, and we made a lot of choices, including the site itself, uh, based on public input. Renderings, renderings, <laughs> more renderings. Okay, and then these are the support service partnerships that are already in place to serve our existing rental um, tenants, but also will apply to this new project. Um, and so I think that's another really important component of working in this space is making sure that uh, tenants have access to a lot of support uh, services and resources of benefit. And then I have to say thank you to the Senior Housing Working Group. Andre Bognor on the right has been working on this project in, in many different forms for over 20 years, uh, much longer than I have, and she has really, she, Helen Iyer, uh, Suzanne Patterson, and then a bunch of other people over the years have really um, kept the momentum going even as we had to try and try again and try again and try again, so they deserve a lot of credit. And then what's next? Um, I think the, the first thing I would say is that, um, you know, last year we came to you to talk to you about how it looks like tax credits line up for Yellow Springs for a big family rental housing project um, in the 2024 and 2025 application cycles. Though, we, though there may be some changes from the, we won't, we won't know the exact scoring for next year until September of this year, but we're moving forward as hoping it doesn't change too much. Um, and then I think late last year I promised you that I would start um, talking with different stakeholders in town. So we did have our first family rental housing stakeholder group. Um, we're going to meet again in early April. Johnny's really leading um, a lot of the, the behind the scenes work. So um, I hope we hope to have additional updates for you soon. Um, we also are probably going to go in in May or June for an additional, for the next round of major home repair grant funding through the USDA Housing Preservation Grant. And so we'll just stay, stay tuned. That's the one that you invested in a couple of years ago. So we'll just keep you in the loop on that. Um, we also were awarded $200,000 in pass-through home repair grants in February through the, from the Federal Home Loan Bank. So we're working to administer 14 projects right now, um, and those are for re homeowners of very low income who are either elderly or disabled. Um, we also plan to break ground on the Cascades. <laughs> Phase one this yes. year, you'll all be getting an invitation. And um, that we don't know the exact time yet because the bids are out. And when the bids are unsealed on April 16th, we'll have a lot better sense of, of the timeline looking forward. Um, and then we, are, we also still have to do final PUD zoning. So we're working through that. Uh, and then we are um, beginning the process of fundraising for the future phases of the Cascades because it's 32 units in all. And the reason we can't just go in for funding all at once is because um, the, the site where it's located um, doesn't score high enough to get the tax credit money right now. Um, so we have to do a much smaller scale um, project phases using different funding streams that are very competitive and, and limited. Um, I think that's it. The last slide is just where we would really like to collaborate. Um, we are looking for your input to help us shape our next chapter as an organization. Uh, we would like to know what collaboration looks like, where we, how we can be helpful, where those points of connection are so that we can move our mutual goals forward. Um, and just we'd like to have a process to learn more about the housing priorities of the village and just find out how we might be able to really um, work together to do more. Thank you. Emily, thank you. I, as you know, I'm a fan of Home Inc. I, I love the magic that you all do with uh, the little bit of money that we uh, give you all uh, and you turn it and leverage it into, into great things. One thing, Judy, I don't know if you can pull it back up. Emily, I'd really like for you to talk to, yes, it's in our packet, but um, for those that people that are listening, the... Um, 
Oh, shoot. Um, the consulting, the peer consulting that you do. Um, oh. I'd like, um, so that's about sure. five slides back. Let me just keep going until we, yeah, it's past the renderings. Uh, we're getting close, aren't we? It was by the, num the, by the numbers slide, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the three peer consulting. If you could just sh share about that. I think that's a, a big deal. Um, it, it, sure. it proves that what you all do, <laughs> you do it so well, that you have a much bigger footprint than just the village of Yale Spring. Yeah, so um, several years ago, we started doing peer consulting. Um, we've done trainings in Washington State. Um, presented a number of conferences. We were one of um, eight national partners with NeighborWorks America a couple years ago through their Shared Equity Housing Initiative. So we helped launch a community land trust in Kansas City. Um, we also, just in the last year, worked with the HIT Foundation out of Eaton, who um, was interested in expanding their USDA programs. Um, we also helped found the, or we supported the, the organizers of the now established Oberlin Community Land Trust and helped them with their first closing. Um, so we have a sister, we have a, the rivalry continues with <laughs> Oberlin. Um, and then there's a group in Dayton uh, who have been meeting every other week for a, for a couple of years now to really look at what if Dayton could be um, have its own community land trust and so we're part of that steering group but yeah that's definitely an important component of our of our work to support peer organizations yeah and I as you know I mean I, I think I asked you a question and then you explained that to me and I'm like I didn't know uh, so this was a, a, a I think it's a, a big deal uh, again uh, I, I'm a fan and, and I support what you all do in fact that you all have impact in other communities, I think is something that I would submit most of us didn't know. Um, uh, we have any other questions or comments from council? I think I'm, I might just highlight, um, I do want to say the village's investments in affordable housing have been significant. I don't want to, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> underscore the fact that, you know, we have like, uh, you know, done a lot for the 10 plus years at least that I've been on council, mm -hmm. and so I really appreciate that. So, um, I think the other piece, um, and I know it was in the presentation, but I do want to elevate. I'm really happy that um, Holmake has taken lead on the low income housing tax credit mm -hmm. opportunity, LIHTC. And um, the other thing is, I think, in regards to that collaboration piece is the more that we can communicate, and I know you and Johnny are like in close touch as well as Meg, um, about what really is gonna make the difference to push us into like accomplishing some of the real work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we need to hear, and so. I think sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle. But anyway, sure. but I do want to say, like, you know, without a doubt, uh, you know, the village has had a long time commitment to this work. And yes. thanks, Hall Mink. Well, yes, thank you for your continued partnership. And we will indeed continue the partnership. All right. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank everything. you. Yes. <laughs> And I was going to see, yeah, I'm looking at Lynn. No, 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 I'm looking at Lynn to see, see if he's going to pop up or, and let me announce it. And, and Lynn, Lynn Kramer, who's also part of Inclusive Resilient Yellow Springs group. So, yes, Lynn Kramer. Yeah. With Hi, our, um, I, I'm Lynn Kramer. Yep. Um, I'm a member of the Livable, Equitable, Age-Friendly Court team. Um, and I think you were briefed on that last earlier this month by uh, our project leader. Um, I'm also a member of the INR Coalition, as Kevin said, and a member of the Village Mediation Program. And you'll find out why I'm here with all those three things. Uh, I, I'm here to report on the results of the Village Cafe held in January uh, of this year. Uh, a little background, the cafe is an initiative from the Livable, Equitable, Age-Friendly Yellow Springs uh, project um, in response to a finding that many community members felt excluded from discussions about community issues. Um, similarly, for several years, we in the mediation program have been looking for processes to help villagers deal with controversial subjects. 
and uh, hadn't really hit on anything that really worked. In 2023, we did something called a, uh, a World Cafe um, in the spring um, using a model that's been used all over the world um, uh, with under the guidance of a consultant. It was reasonably successful and we believe it can be more successful as we use this model more and get more expertise. <clears throat> expertise and familiarity with it, sorry. Um, the model is uh, people get together in a large room with tables and um, they, they consist of three or four rounds, different questions each round, and people sit at different tables with different people each time. And some of you were at our cafe in January, maybe even last March, and, and experienced it to some degree. Um, this year, in January, um, we got a group of volunteers together to talk, to structure a village cafe to engage in civil discourse, to build new relationships, to hear and be heard. Um, the Community Foundation agreed to act as a uh, convener for the cafe and provided financial support. Uh, we had over 75 people attend and most stayed the full two hours. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the results. Uh, round one's question was what attracted us to Yellow Springs? The results emphasized Yellow Springs' identity as a welcoming small town with a strong community with, and values, strong values. Nature, uh, arts, diversity, and education stood out as strengths in the comments. The question for round two was, what makes us feel strongly about Yellow Springs? The results here showed there's a mixture of affection and concern for the town as it changes with a shared hope that we can retain its special character. And that special character doesn't mean the same thing to everybody, but everybody feels it's special. So, mm -hmm. uh, Round three we asked, what do we want to do now? This round focused more on ideas and suggestions for Yellow Springs going forward, including an orientation toward concrete steps to retain what people value about Yellow Springs while addressing pressing issues around affordability and inclusion. Collaborative dialogue and community-driven solutions were supported. These are similar to things we found in the LEAF survey that we did in 21 and 22. Uh, we think the cafe fulfilled its objective of providing a space for civil discourse. Uh, we think people developed relationships with people they had never met before in the course of the meeting. Now, I, I know Brian was there, and since he knows everybody, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> him who did that, but um, other people didn't know everyone. <laughs> right. Um, we believe that future cafes uh, will be will be really effective. Uh, a lot of the attendees signed up to get notices about future cafes, and a number of people contacted me who couldn't make it to the January session, and they're interested too. So we have a mailing list of over 100 names to, uh, to inform about future cafes. And we, we will be suggesting to the VMP steering committee that that organization become the home for the process and work with organizations that want to hold a cafe for some purpose. Um, so, with the idea that we will try to hold three to four of these a year, um, the INR Coalition, as Emily said, is planning meetings this spring uh, on the subject of affordability to follow up on what was the pressing concerns. Um, the first will be talking about definitions and data, and that's the one in the Senior Center on April 11th, and there'll be advertising about that going out this week. The second, which will be in May, will be a uh, village cafe where people can sit and talk in small groups about these issues. Um, and we haven't yet picked a date for that. And that concludes my report. Are there any questions? Brian, you want to, um, when I know you, as Lynn advised, you were at uh, uh, the the actual uh, Village Cafe and, and you uh, submitted uh, some information. I uh, just want to give yeah, you an opportunity. I, actually, I do want to, you know, and um, Gavin was also there. Oh, okay, um, I'm sorry. I didn't, yeah, I didn't know. and we also had uh, Johnny, uh, who brought his wife, uh, as well as Meg and Florence. Um, 
Yeah, I, w- I was very impressed, and I love the World Cafe like model. I think we've you know used it well like a, a couple times. Um, what I have been thinking about like as you know we got the feedback because I think one thing you know Lynn is that we're talking about like a involved strategic planning where I think the feedback from you know this village cafe uh, interaction as well as uh, the leaf survey has been great um, really informs that um, I wonder if we can fold in, we have a couple things. One is um, updating our active transportation plan. Um, so I guess I'd like to like stay involved in just, you know, what opportunities there are to like, you know, pull those into the community engagement. Um, but otherwise, uh, I know, Gavin, you, you have some thoughts about like how we might like, extend this conversation, but I'm really excited and I appreciate the, uh, uh, the active, you know, pursuit for community feedback. It's really helpful for us. Yeah, thanks. I, it, uh, it's important for everybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Gavin, I do apologize. I forgot that you were at that uh, cafe as well. Do you want to share anything? No, I mean, I, I thought it, it surfaced a bunch of the issues that we're all you know aware I think and um, so yeah looking forward to continuing the conversation and figuring out what we can do about some of these things okay all right great okay. thank, thank you, you. Lynn. appreciate it good seeing you, you. all righty we uh, managers report it's great oh, man this is great mm. we have a time one <laughs> <laughs> okay um, Phase two storm is underway for phase two of Springs Meadow. They started that today. Uh, the eclipse uh, event is scheduled. Uh, Paige wrapped up a bunch of stuff on it. I want to highlight the uh, website that Ben put together, eclipse at yso.com, right? Dot yso. Dot yso. Uh, or you can go to our face or our website and it can, it's linked there as well and then uh, biometric event is on the 23rd um, I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago but I'm going to mention it again uh, especially to the restaurants downtown and businesses get your grease traps in line we are getting a ton of grease coming into our sewer plant because of all the fish fries it could be it could be that's what i've been doing yes so uh please double check and triple check them to make sure they are working properly um library we uh we did some good work behind that library we got that area cleaned up to where they can use it limestone steps it looks tremendous nice, uh, nice. tanner tanner and his crew and and myers uh landscaping helped us out um they are rebuilding the pitchers boxes at uh, gaunt park and working on the fields the mm-hmm. high school season is getting ready to kick off uh so they are trying to get that all squared away mm-hmm. so the high school can have a great season there. Um, the kitchen is half done down in the, um, the youth center. Mm-hmm. I actually know that she's actually been able to cook some meatball subs. Uh, worked great for the kids, and, and actually a couple of parents were running late, and so they was able to take partake as well. And oh, nice. she's just excited. The uh, electric is being installed this week, and then we'll be changing the color and putting the backsplash on. But uh, it looks great and the kids are loving it as well great so uh look for more pictures to come on that one lifeguards are needed and we're not getting very many applications so if you know you know someone that mm. is looking for a job as a lifeguard uh even if they don't have certification get a hold of samantha mm. uh we we may have to wind up training some other people like we did last year yeah. so does that mean we're looking for all ages all ages okay all ages okay. uh get with samantha stewart in the youth center um and she will get you set up to become a lifeguard well, I'm, well I, I'm guessing, like, with a lot of the part-timers at Antioch, that, correct. you know. I'm right. just going to say that because, yeah. um, I mean, I've 
part of my responsibilities at the college is to create email accounts for everyone, and I've created about eight in the last couple of weeks of lifeguards coming on. So, right. you know, if they can share, to, I think to Brian's point right. about being part time. So, right. um, if you want to reach out to uh, uh, yep. Kathy Ross um, at the college, um, that'll be good. And, I, and I'll say something to Kathy as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, she has already got the pool inspection scheduled. They are filling up faster, so she slid herself in there, and we have got that ready. So now we have a deadline that we're going to be ready so we can open up on time. Uh, House Bill 168, which is the water line project, started. Uh, they have, I believe, I've not left the office today, but they, uh, they should have the one road complete uh, on center, East Center College. And then they'll be changing over to the west side, but we will notify them homeowners that we're coming to that side. So uh, it is going very well. Uh, and there's been some rain and some delays that way, but other than that, it's been going great. Um, Rose uh, has put her list of things in there. Our RFP for the water meters is out. They are due next week. Uh, so we are hoping to bring it back to council in the April time frame to be able to award the contract and be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. At the same time that she's doing that, they're also taking the inventory for the lead and the lead and galvanized lines because it is due in October of 24. So okay. Travis is working on that as well. Uh, she did the Tantalus update system on the electric meters. We now have 901 of our electric meters are read directly. Uh, we have full charts. We have everything on them. So we actually have 1173 left to change out. So we're hoping to be able to put in the budget, change all those out, and then we'll be 100% Tantalus uh, to be able to get a lot more detail, be able to get onto the uh, app to be able to check out what you're using, your water at the same time, notify you in case of a leak, and so on. If you turn the page or if you go to the next page after her Tantalus update, one of the water meters, she actually put this chart in there, she was able to catch this water leak on the Tantalus system mm -hmm. on a water meter that she had hooked up. Okay. And this is a commercial account. And um, you can see how the water meter uh, started and how it ended. So she was able to flag that account to let them know. Again, it was a water softener. Highly recommend you keep your eyes on your water softener. It was mm -hmm. discharging in a back mechanical room. They had no idea. And luckily she was able to let them know and get that problem resolved. Good. Um, Ben had the new TriCaster installed, so uh, that was a budget item that we had budgeted for, and it's up and running. And I believe that is about all we have. We actually canceled the special report, um, and it will be coming back in the very next packet. Uh, we had some people out sick, and we wasn't able to get that report together. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the special report for about the, the storm, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I see this appears new to me, the, the Channel 5 uh, that, information. Yes, that is Ben's. Mm -hmm. ben is, uh, and that was, uh, he put in there that it's after the storm, how it raised up and uh, reached over 17,000 accounts. So we are in the process of uh, trying to make things better communication-wise and all that. Um, we will be uh, reaching out to another vendor. We're actually going to uh, do text messaging to where Ben will be able to send out text message alerts. Uh, we've been trying to get this underway. We finally got the quote back, and so we will be signing a contract to where Bank can actually send out alerts or messages to where you get it on your phone. Mm -hmm. Great. So, good. So, so kind of related to this, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the website, um, we had talked about, like, you know, having, like, maybe a preview before it's launched. And yes. so I saw, like, the April 15th, you know, proposed launch date. Um, 
I think that would be a soft launch to see how everybody's liking it. Is that correct? The old website will still be there, and then we'll we'll kind of launch it to see how everybody likes it, see what we need to change. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And, like, you know, if anyone on council or whatever, like, knows of, like, you know, commission folks, for example, or, like, citizens that are always, like, trying to look for things on the website. Um, right. I mean, I've got, like, a dozen names or whatever, but maybe it'd be nice to do, yeah, more of a soft launch, so. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that if you haven't viewed the Eclipse website, that you go there because that's how user-friendly the new website will be. Cool. So I, I would definitely take time to view the website, plus it'd make you in your day travel easier because you'll know where everything's at. There we go. That's important to know. <laughs> Gavin, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, just the text message thing yes. just made me made me think. Um, I know in the budget process we were talking about doing the like mailings. Yes. Is that still something that we're thinking about starting to do this year? Uh, first quarter, we're trying to get it out. We've, we've slowed some process, but we are That's doing fine. quarterly updates. Ben has got a thing together to be able to figure this out, but we've had some delays in the last. But you mean the newsletter, newsletter, right? Newsletter, correct. It was highlighted. It is it's highlighted, but I don't like... think that day's going to happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying, ain't we, Ben? <laughs> so. Well, who and who is the newsletter team? I mean, ben, ben is heading it up, but we are actually going to be reaching out to people to get some different things. So we'll have, we'll be in contact. Council will have a section in there as well. Okay. Cool. Nice. All right. Any other questions for village manager? All right. Well, thank you, Johnny. Right. And thank you, Ben. We appreciate everything. Uh, we have no old business. Um, period. I won't come. I was going to comment on something, <laughs> but I'm not. There's nothing there. So it's time for our Sunshine Law Review from our village solicitor. That's right. Okay. Thank you. So what prompted this tonight was several conversations that I've had over the uh, last couple of months with Gavin and some other members of council as well about what is allowable under the Sunshine Law in terms of council members talking to each other and what isn't. So Sunshine Law is a broad um, umbrella. It covers both public records and open meetings. Tonight we're only going to talk about the Open Meetings Act. Most of your public records issues are handled um, pretty competently by your staff, I'd like to say. The only thing you need to think about in terms of public records is that when you are um, communicating with people, you are creating public records, emails and um, text messages even could be considered public records. So keep that in mind with any communications that you put in writing. On the open meeting side, um, so uh, for the purposes of this body, there's a lot of discussion, right, about what can and can't happen between a majority of members talking to each other. The reason we're always talking about that majority of members is because that's the way the law is written, that when you have a prearranged gathering with the majority of the members of this board, so three of you or more, to discuss or deliberate about the public business, those are the three things that you need under Ohio law to have triggered a meeting. Once we have a meeting, we have to have notice, we have to have someone taking minutes, um, has to be open to the public, right? So if those three things occur, then you've got a meeting that needs to happen, ideally only in here and only in this, in this venue, in this forum. Those words, shockingly, have been strangled a little bit over the years by the courts, right? Because a prearranged gathering meant something very different when the Open Meetings Act was drafted. Um, that was long before anyone was considering things like forums on Facebook or um, reply all to an email. The law, the, the text of the statutes has not changed, but the courts have taken those words and applied them to those circumstances to find open meetings issues um, with something like a reply all on an email, which is why we're always a broken record when we send an email to all five of you, please don't reply all, um, because those there are cases out there that have found a violation of the Open Meetings Act, which is to say, okay, you, more than three, three or more of you, deliberated or discussed public business by reply all in an email, therefore you violated the act. You should have done that in an open meeting where people could hear your discussion or deliberation. That's fairly straightforward. Um, and then when you get into things like uh, social media, I believe, I don't know that I've ever heard 
any concerns about this board of any of you discussing or deliberating things on social media um, that could potentially be a violation of the Open Meetings Act. But you want to be careful and cognizant of that as well, right? That if it is public business, if you're discussing it on social media, there could potentially be that same type of concern as you could have within uh, reply all email. I don't know that there's any cases in Ohio that have gotten there yet, but it took us a really long time to even get to the reply all email case. That just came out a few years back. Anyone doing what I do has been saying for quite a while, don't reply all, right? Because surely that could be found by the courts to be a violation. And then finally it was. Had to get the right case teed up, right? So now the bigger concern, the more, I think, the more practical, day-to-day, -day, realistic issue comes in this context, right? You have an idea. And you think, well, this is a great idea. We could do this, right? I'm going to call Gavin and talk to him about it. And then I'm going to call Carmen and talk to her about it. And then I'm going to call Brian and then I'm going to call Trish. So by the time you've come in here and you've sat on the dais, and that's just a hypothetical, Kevin does not do that. Well, I do have um, a lot of great ideas. But so. right, you do have great ideas, right? <laughs> by the time you come in here and you sit up on the dais in front of the cameras and in front of your citizens, you've already discussed the public business, right? So there, every, people in this room and watching you online may not have the opportunity to hear what Kevin called and said to Gavin, right? And how the idea morphed during those conversations, the same they, they would have if you'd all been sitting up here. Mm -hmm. So then you get to this spectrum. Them, right, where there are um, there's two approaches on either end of the spectrum that you could take to this, which is to say that that scenario I just spelled out, sure, have at it, right? There are certainly communities that operate that way. That is in violation of the Open Meetings Act. It's what courts would call either a round robin issue or a serial meetings issue, um, S E R I A L, not you know, like Fruit Loops, right? But so yeah, you that's that's where you get into that issue where if you've just got everyone talking to everyone all the time, calling each other one right after the other to discuss the public business, you've got that serial meetings violation. There are communities that do it, no one should. If you get caught, you've got a violation of the law. Opposite end of the spectrum is where we tend to slide towards here in Yellow Springs, which is to say that you are all very careful about not talking to each other outside of this meeting about public business. Um, to the point where I believe at some point when I'm talking up here, Judy's going to start to cringe. It hasn't happened yet, but it's coming. Well, still good. Still good. Okay. <laughs> Solicitors before me, uh, specifically the last two I know. I, I can't speak all the way back to John Chambers and how he was handling this, but the last two have always said stay on this end of the spectrum. Do not talk to more than one other member of council about anything that could have anything to do with the public business. That is um, an extremely conservative approach to the laws that will always keep you out of trouble with the Open Meetings Act and it's also uh, maybe an over interpretation of the way the law is meant to be applied. Because for example, if three of you run into each other on the street and one of you says, hey, did you see that thing in the packet? And every, all three of you start standing there talking about the thing that's coming up in the packet. Do we have a violation of the Open Meetings Act? depends on the exact facts and it would depend on how a court would look at it, I could certainly make an argument that that was not a violation because it's not a prearranged gathering. But should three of you be standing on the street talking about the public business, about something that's going to be in front of you that you know citizens might be interested in hearing your discussion? No, of course not. Right? That does that that it, that flies directly in the face of what the Open Meetings Act exists uh, to prevent. So somewhere in there is that gray area, which is obnoxious to hear from your solicitor. I know that. And I try hard to say that this is a gray area and there's no clear answer. But there really is never a clear answer unless we sit on one of these ends of the spectrum, which is to say, wild, wild west, anything goes. Obviously, we're never going to um, err on that side, right? Or where you've always generally hovered, which is to say, don't ever talk to another member of this board, more than one other member of this board, about a matter of public business because you could be in violation of the Open Meetings Act. So scheduling, for example, I mean, so that was one thing because I guess I've been talking with the school board about, you know, how they're advised and how we're advised or whatever, but I mean, scheduling's not really... Scheduling of a meeting? Or if we talk about scheduling, like, you know, I mean, is that... Is so that an issue? I typically, mean, the way that always happens here is it's all funneled through Judy. Sure. And I that, mean, but that's what I, I guess I'm like getting at, like what you said about we're on this side and I'm good with that. But I've heard that scheduling is one of the issues where, like, 
it's not really a sunshine like thing. So well, if the if the five of you were setting about scheduling your own council meetings, arguably we'd have a bigger issue. Um, but I, I don't know that that would ever really be a problem here because our meetings happen in such a formal way with so much formal notice and in this room that um, now if Judy sends an email to all of all five of you that says, we need to schedule this meeting. Can you meet at on Thursday at four o'clock? And you all reply all to Judy and say, yes, I can be there on Thursday at 4 o'clock. And we've violated this cardinal never reply all um, rule. Do I think there's a violation of, this, of, the, Sun, of the Open Meetings Act? No. I know. I mean, that's you, if you're scheduling a meeting, you're all going to come in here and sit and discuss. If you reply all and say, 4 o'clock works for me on Thursday, I will definitely be voting no, then obviously we've got a different issue, right? Mm -hmm. So um, substance over form. I mean, but the other problem with this is, is the Ohio Supreme Court doesn't weigh in a lot, right? So we've got, we've got districts around the um, state that sometimes have differing opinions or interpret certain facts in different ways. Um, I tried to pull some second district stuff today, which is where we sit, to see if I could find something that would be useful to this discussion. And didn't really come up with anything terribly um, applicable. But, you know, I, I don't, I know if one of you has a conversation about affordable housing with one other of you, and then you feel like, well, I can't ever talk to anybody else on council about affordable housing ever again, that's a really restrictive approach and perhaps unnecessarily restrictive. Up, it, it, up and until someone brings a challenge, right? And that's the, like, the end of all of it is. You don't want to have to be, we don't want to have to be in court defending against an open meetings violation, right? It comes with all the kind of scary stuff to say court costs and attorney's fees if the person who sues us is successful, things like that, the monetary damages. But also, you run the risk of whatever decision that you made that's been challenged can be overturned. We have to revisit it. It's messy. It's complicated. Um, and it's, it's just never a position that you want to be in. You do, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, you do also represent citizens of a very engaged community. There are a lot of public boards that don't have a citizenry that's nearly as involved as yours is. And so you, perhaps even more so than your average council around the state, have an expectation that they want to hear everything you're thinking about these issues that you'll be voting on, and they want to hear it in an open meeting. And perhaps that's also sort of educated the advice that's come from your solicitors before me, which is to say, just don't talk about any of it, right? Be but again, a conversation about affordable housing with one of you and then a conversation about affordable housing with another of you is not necessarily um, going to result in an open meetings violation and a, and a lawsuit we can't defend. And you know, it's, it's just, um, it's a gray area. There is that spectrum of advice from where I stand. There's a spectrum from behavior from where elected officials sit. Um, and if you are always generally pushing yourself towards this end of the spectrum, then you're generally always going to be okay. We are generally going to always be okay. And if you have questions of somewhere in the middle, call me. Call me and Judy. Get us both on the phone. We're happy to have that conversation. We have had that conversation a couple of different times. Um, if there's something that, you know, I, well, I talked to Brian about this, but now I would like to say this to Trish. Can I do that? We have had those conversations, and it's perfectly fine to do that and, and vet it ahead of time. Uh, and if you're thinking about it like that, then chances are you're never running afoul of the act to begin with. Does that help at all? If there's specific examples that you want to run through, we can. I think I had asked, initially asked Amy about coming in because um, we hadn't all had this conversation with the new body, like since you had joined Trish. And um, there have been points where it's felt like people were operating on different sort of expectations about it. Um, and I also felt like it was important for the public to have a sense. I'm consistently talk to people um, that don't understand the limitations that we have in communication, um, that it's not as easy as it is in just about every other part of your life where you have four or five people that are trying to figure something out and you just all check in with all of them and figure out where the middle ground is and then you know, ha you know have that end result. 
that once we've talked to one other person uh, about it, uh, you know, and I, I look at it as like about something substantive or policy wise that not like the scheduling kind of things, but if we're talking about something substantive that may end up before this body for decision making, that um, that's the person that we can talk to and then the rest of it happens up here in public. Um, so anyway, just felt like it was worthwhile to uh, make sure that we we're all on the same page about how things work. And that brings up a good point, Gavin, because when you think about those three prongs about the prearranged gathering of a majority of members for the discussion or deliberation of public business, that your scheduling example would not really be the discussion of public business, right? It's a it's a um, a mechanism to end up in the same room to discuss the business. But the the state the courts have defined discussion, which is exactly what you expect it to be: the exchange of thoughts or ideas and deliberation, which is um, you know kind of a step up from discussion, which is to say you're weighing different pros and cons to a fact to different factors in a decision making um, process so yeah there's um there's an idea on the public records side of the house, which is to say that transient documents are not, don't have to be kept as public records, right? Which is, hey, can you meet for lunch at noon? That would be a transient email, right? Something that would not rise to the level of a record that you'd have to keep. Um, if you apply that same sort of thinking, that's what I think Gavin's getting at here. You're not rising to the level of a discussion of public business when you're scheduling a meeting. Amy, you, I believe you said earlier that um, you know the, when the statute was written, the social media wasn't as big a deal, but do you anticipate that changing or the statute changing to be more specific? To my knowledge, there's not been any discussion about, um, about revising those, stat those statutes, actually. Uh, the executive, se executive session statute has been revised in recent years um, to reflect some um, economic development topics that can be taken into executive session. So it's not that the General Assembly hasn't touched it at all, but they have not tweaked this um, this part. And like I say, the courts are finding a way to use what used to only apply to this type of context and apply it to this texting, email, social media world. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, which makes sense. It's a written record, no matter how it happens. Yeah, it, right. Right. And then you know, yes, if, and then if you're. If in, we all yes. three wrote letters about the public business. Right. Oh, that's yes, that reminds me of something. We had also talked about at one point using, if you were to use one word document, um, and oh, okay, this is a policy that we should write. So it's going to go from you, and then it's going to go down, and I'll forward it to Gavin, he'll forward it to Carmen, and forward it to Brian and Trish. Okay, now you've all put comments in this document, and you've tweaked language, and you've changed things. That that's going to be that's going to be too close to that discussion of public or deliberation of public business outside of the public forum. So even though again that's not contemplated at all by that idea of a prearranged gathering of a majority of members, um, it raises the alarm bells enough that we would want to avoid doing something like that. So when there is a policy that council is looking at or revising, instead it comes from Judy. And Judy says, here's the policy, have at it, you know, get your red pen out and then send it back to me. And then we will take those things and put it into a form that you can come in here and discuss and address in a public meeting. Wow. Well, you know, that has been one thing that hasn't been so clear because sometimes that feedback has gone back to one council member or whatever. So I think what I think I would like to come out of this is some kind of memo that just kind of highlights, like, I think what I heard you, Amy, saying about, like, where this council is at with some of these issues. Um, I don't think it has to, like, be real in-depth, but... Um, um, you know, I'm hearing some things that also reminds me of, you know, what are the worst case scenarios when, like, wow, we all did, like, hang out at the trail and talk, and, you know, somebody, like, comes after us, and then they get, like, the $1,000, like, stipend or whatever. So I know there's, like, something like that, too, where, you know, can't really prove like I mean there was nothing that went on but you can like get sure you know right and there are a few cases that help in that regard if you're the public body where it's found well they, they literally ran into each other and had a conversation we're not finding a violation but if you're if you're invoking that case and making that argument then you're already on your heels defending against an open meetings violation lawsuit um, which you know and it, it gets 500 bucks is what the General Assembly has it set out as the fine that gets levied against a board if you're found to violate but it doesn't stop there because because it could 
it could bring with it attorney's fees, which can be much more pricey. Mm -hmm. um, but the, um, so the concern, like I say, I hate to harp too much on the um, financial aspect of it because the point of the law is to, for all of your, you know, for public business to happen in the sunshine, for people to hear it and see it and know where everyone's coming from. So, um, but yeah, I'm happy to do that. I can put together a memo. We can, it'll basically, the more, the more I reduce it to writing, <laughs> the more it's going to push it towards that end of the spectrum, right? Because right. even though we might have a conversation where Judy's response to me is, well, I'm surprised to hear you say it. I thought you were going to tell me that we definitely couldn't do this or approach it that way. But, you know, in the mo it's like ethics concerns, right? It's like if you call and say, hey, I have a concern. Do I need to recuse from this? Well, all right, let's hear the facts. Let's play it out. Let's think about different implications. There's, you know, every scenario is different and has to be judged on its own merits. So, but yeah, I'm happy to do that. I can put that in writing and, um, and I'll circulate it back, you know, around to council by... Well, I'm out of town next week. Right. Disclosure. Yeah, I don't think so, it's a big well, rush, but I, I, <laughs> No, no, no. Oh, no are you out of town next week? <laughs> we need I've it been tomorrow. warning everyone yeah. that I'm out of town next week. But I like it in terms of, I mean, like I said that, I mean, I know, uh, you know, we had an individual, like, in the past, too, like, got his several 500 bucks, you know, for, oh, you know, yeah. again, like, laying things with the village. So I think that's good to know, but also... Uh, when Gavin mentioned the thing about just kind of the public understanding like how we're operating <coughs> and again like yeah we can't all see each other like out in public and it doesn't mean we're you know doing right. business or whatever so right. you know and, and if there's going to be a memo oh there'll be a memo <laughs> <laughs> Not next week. Not next week. Not next week. <laughs> um, you, you alluded to some changes in the rationale for executive session, and I'm n never sure. I'd be uh, happy to put that in there, and that is yeah. very useful. Yes, I'll, I can put in the reasons, um, the permissible reasons to, to recuse into exec session. Everybody's familiar with the top, the big ones, right? Personnel issues um, and pending or imminent litigation. But real there's, estate. Um, there's several other. A lot of them that aren't respond that aren't relevant to us, like. Um, hospital board type reasons, but um, purchase and sale of public property mm -hmm. is one of them, and yeah, so I, I'll be happy to include that for sure. Okay, there's, but you know, the the interesting thing is you talked about uh, you, the example you gave was you know a, a memo was created, and then each of us adds to it. I was recently just thinking about us using, uh, I think Gavin, you even suggested um, Google Docs, and Google, ah, yeah, 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 <laughs> you know where where we're. I'm starting to get heated up here. That's right. <laughs> Big conversation. Uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's important. Um, yeah, where there's a, we're all actively at the same time mm -hmm. in a document. I guess that's like a big, big... When Gavin movement. called to have that conversation with me a while back, it pained me a little bit to say, I think I see... A I think that runs the risk of perhaps being a violation because it does seem like a really useful tool that would be um, that could help, you know, help us push things along. That mm -hmm. sometimes get it, it can be very clunky to funnel things through one person and then mm -hmm. wait and see a document that's got everybody's changes. I and certainly I understand that, but um, it makes me nervous enough that my I would advise. On this end of the but to be clear, I never suggested that we use it as a group. No, we just no, talked no, about no. Just yes. I've, I've asked about the possibility of using it in the context context of agenda planning, where mm -hmm. there are only two members that are part of it. And anyway, yes. so I understand. Well, and I in that understand. context, yes, then yeah. we, we would likely very well could use it. it yeah. Bearing in mind, then you run public records issues, right? Because every time the document changes, you need to maintain the last version of the document. So there's, I guess, that concern too. Yeah. Now and she's cringing. Yeah. That happens automatically <laughs> in the program. I mean, oh, does it? Yeah, every change is flag is is maintained. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You don't even have to hit save. And I will, uh, to for the record, uh, it was my idea to go beyond what what Kevin suggested. Okay. I just thought about it because. Uh, yeah, okay. I have yeah, to be that a, does ring a bell, right? Yeah, yeah I'm a Google ad man, yeah, and right. so I know the value of it. And so, but yeah, it, it would it, it certainly raises red flags. I when live think squarely about it. in a Microsoft world. Yep. <laughs> well, you got to live somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions for Solicitor Blankenship? 
Nope. All right. Okay. Yeah, so if it's all right with everyone, I'm going to hit the road. I have to travel right. tonight, so I'm going to go ahead and jump. Great. <laughs> have a great night. Thanks. Thank you. Usually when Amy leaves early, we get out early. Uh -oh. So let, let, us, let us see what we can do. Thank you again, Amy. Sure. Appreciate you. Travel well. Um, we are now to... Oh, Carmen. Yep. Um, the America... 250 proposal. It was a very nice uh, memo in our packet. Go ahead. I'm going to yeah, hand so you the, the uh, Ohio Municipal League sent out an email that Brian uh, flagged. There is an initiative called America 250. So basically, the state of Ohio and the Ohio Municipal League are inviting municipalities from across our great state to join in celebrating the 250th anniversary. Um, of the U.S. by becoming an official AM250 community. And what that means is that the village will have the opportunity, or village leadership will have the opportunity to network and partner and exchange information with the state commission team. Uh, Yellow Springs, with its rich history of supporting people from marginalized groups, notably in this specific case, um, formerly enslaved, Africans, dating back some 160 years, holds a unique place in our nation's history. It just does. Uh, the village was, pit, was a pivotal stop on the Underground Railroad and has strong ties to internationally recognized abolitionists such as Antioch College founder Horace Mann and Moncure Conway. And because we have a connection to Horace Mann, we have a connection to Harriet Tubman. Um, in sharing this unique history with other Ohio communities, we will have funding opportunities available that the village could use in myriad ways, from working with schools to develop curricula and education for all members of our community, to extending event participation to other parts of the county. The Public Arts and Cultural Commission wishes to partner with other community groups, including Antioch College, the 365 Project, and others to ensure that we put our best foot forward in these efforts to highlight what a genuinely distinctive Village Yellow Springs is and the significant role our community has had in shaping the history of Ohio and of the country. Should council agree to move forward, a resolution committing to engage in educational and celebratory activities related to the above, as described, um, will come to the table at council's next meeting. This is a tremendous opportunity to highlight a lot of, you know, the kind of little known facts about the village historically that people would not know unless they did a really deep dive, um, which I've been doing for the last three years. Um, and I think it's important to kind of elevate this because we really um, were pivotal the state of Ohio, period, but Yellow Springs specifically and Greene County were very were, were pivotal um, with the efforts of what became now and what we know now as the Underground Railroad. That's my that's my spiel. That's your spiel. Thank you. So thank you, Councilperson Brown. I'm getting formal. Yes, yeah, so I'll make a motion that we bring forward this resolution at the next meeting. I'd love to like, you know, be like a front runner on this and I'm so glad that you're picking this up. Yeah, we're doing it. That's great. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. All right. Um, is there any other discussion? And I will begin the discussion. <coughs> Excuse me, Carmen in the, um, well, Brian just said, uh, Thank you for picking it up. Um, I presume that you will be one of the one to two folks that'll be named in um, the documentation. I'm just looking over some of the some of the requirements. Are you have, have you looked out to to any other folks that'll be involved? Oh, that would be the other so, one like or I two. So, 365 Project, mm -hmm. Antioch, um, uh, Relief Group, mm -hmm. 
Um, there are there are many uh, many other people that that could potentially be the, the second. Mm -hmm. So, but when this well, I, I, not even potentially, as soon as people heard about this, like mm -hmm. yeah, they've like jumped in. So mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of interest. Yeah, but specifically you're saying one or two right. individuals, but but sure. but in terms of named individuals, I presume you'll be one. I, I'm right. guessing. And, I, and I have I have not. Um, well, I have thought of the, maybe who the second person might be if they're interested, and there are a couple of people that I uh, will be approaching about this. Okay. All right. Good. Any other discussion? All right. Uh, we have a uh, motion and a second um, um, uh, requesting that we, uh, in a, a uh, resolution, uh, be developed and brought forward to council. Um, all those in favor of doing so, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, seeing none, the motion is passed. I'm looking to Judy, but I'll just let resolution development happen the way it happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Carmen. Appreciate you. And I've lost my agenda. Board commission? <laughs> yes, board and commissions is good. Uh, are there any board and commission reports? Um, anyone wants to, uh, any information from those board and commission reports that are in the packet? Anyone wants to highlight? I have a couple things. Sure. Uh, actually, two for you. So I just wanted to, um, now that I have boards and commissions, I'm like trying to get back on track with written reports or whatever. So, I mean, they are really great. Um, and I hope people, you know, like do like check in. But Kevin, two things that were like triggered for you. One is um, the Environmental Commission is hoping to get two booths uh, for street fair. Mm -hmm. um, and since you're our uh, chamber liaison, um, and for context, last year they got four booths. So hopefully two booths will be like be easy. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and then hopefully not near like any music or whatever, since they're yeah. talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> it was rough. I was screaming to people about butterflies. Okay. Yeah, they, they, they don't go together, do they? Butterflies and screaming. Screaming about pollinators. Yeah. See, that's right. Okay. But, All right. You know, I mean, butterflies get loud. Um, and then, uh, secondly, um, there's you know continued interest in the zero waste thing, mm -hmm. and I do want to uh, highlight. Um, I want to read a little bit of a. Uh, a press release I got because this is so cool. Mm -hmm. But um, the Environmental Commission, if the chamber is interested, would like to have a conversation about how they could support, you know, either like tote bags or whatever, or um, like complimentary like grant efforts. And so I don't think that had happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And so, if you could just kind of, you know, make an introduction or, you know, talk to Alex, mm -hmm. which also means talking to Alex Klug, you know, and yep. get the Alexes together. <laughs> um, but anyway, some of it, I think everybody knows a little bit about this, but I just want to like read briefly because Carmen mentioned this at the Environmental Commission uh, meeting. But there's a grant program for zero waste mm -hmm. uh, events, and the chamber scored some money. And so I'll just read like briefly the Recycle Ohio grant program administered by the Ohio EPA aims to support local efforts to enhance recycling and waste reduction practices across the state. The Yellow Springs Chamber of Commerce successfully applied. Um, and this underscores their commitment to fostering eco-conscious practices within the community, a true pil pillar of village values. And so um, basically, just highlight the grants. Uh, they got $43,600. 
and um, this is going to like support the street fairs this upcoming uh, year, uh, both in June and October. Okay. So Great. really cool. But one of the things I appreciated that Alex uh, communicated in some emails was that the village could also apply for funds um, to complement their efforts. Mm -hmm. And so if we figure out what everybody's doing, and I think the Environmental Commission wants to do that, that would be cool. Okay. So. That's Great. All I've got. Great. Thank you. And um, Gavin, I'm going to say to you uh, as our as a secondary liaison, um, I missed last week's uh, chamber board meeting because my schedule changed at the last minute. So um, I will, if the opportunity uh, situation presents itself again, I will try to get you uh, notice in advance um, for you to be prepared to attend uh, that meeting, which is the first Thursday of the month, uh, 8.30. Yeah. So uh, great, great, good stuff. Um, so Brian, let's follow up later to make sure that I'm clear on, 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 on the ask. Cool. Okay. Um, any other board and commission? Yeah, updates? PACC. So on the 9th of March, we hosted what was the 45th Women's Voices Out Loud event at the Herndon Gallery. Um, it would have been, if it, there wouldn't have been a lag, it would have been the 45th um, event. Um, on the campus of Antioch College, attendance reached almost 60, and we I think we had seven seven performers. Um, we heard from women from the community from very diverse backgrounds over many genres. Um, so PACC member and director of the Herndon, Michael Caselli curated a beautiful show in no time at all, mm -hmm. um, in a matter of a couple days. So there's art still hanging that'll be available for public view um, in the gallery until the 24th. And the Public Arts and Culture Commission is really honored to be such a, I mean, a part of a part of the community that's so. Um, we people were really looking forward to this event, mm -hmm. and I will say that I was, I was a little worried, a little worried about what attendance would be like. We got to the Herndon. I set up 25 chairs. I went home to grab my stuff to to read, and when I got there they had to put out 25 more shares mm -hmm. and then some people were standing. Yeah. Um, it was, it was, it was really, um, I have lots of words for it, but <laughs> I will say that there are a lot of images, paintings, charcoal drawings of um, women's bodies hanging up at the Herndon for everybody who would like to, to see them. Um, <laughs> One of them is a beautiful image, charcoal drawing by Florence Lorenz, who used to work at Antioch in the library, who made the drawing in like 1960. It is, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's an incredible charcoal rendering. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Cool. So, yeah, it was good. Yeah. It was good. Well, thank you. I have to, I have to swing by there. Yeah. Um, exciting yeah. and we don't have a library commission report because our meeting ended up being canceled so. yeah well there's um, there is some some library information in the packet it was good I, I was happy to see it seemed like we, we talked about those steps for steps. ever and then all of a sudden so bam, Johnny's people got involved <laughs> mm -hmm. bam they were done so cool 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 great I appreciate that that input uh, uh, that acknowledgement Trish appreciate that all right. Any other board and commission updates? I don't don't have anything for various reasons. Um, so, if there's nothing, we will well, move. Maybe on. just I'm sorry. a reminder: if anybody does want to attend the MDRPC annual dinner, um, let you know ASAP. So it's on my calendar. When is that? April 18th, I believe. Okay. So, yeah. So yeah, if we if we could 
get something and maybe I, just share I with everyone? I did send that out, and I did ask, mm -hmm. and I did already put in a PO. So if you do want to go, um, let me know. Well, you're put, already mine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Judy, put me down for sure. Okay. <laughs> you're reluctant, ain't you? No, I'm not reluctant. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't know if I could bring my wife. <laughs> but I probably won't. Yeah, you totally can. And, I mean... I guess just to remind Meg if she's not like signed up, it would yeah. be great. If yeah, she that would go. be good. So are we are we and Denise can Denise could join us too. Yeah. So are you doing like a table? Nope, not doing it. It's okay. Just fifty dollars a person. Yep. Okay. Uh, I won't ask for the bills to pay for my wife though. We'll see. If she comes, I'll pay you. <laughs> yeah, if she comes. All right. Spend fifty bucks and bring my wife. <laughs> Yeah. So I can least see her. Stop. <laughs> Good idea. All right. Thank, thank you, Brian, for that. I appreciate that. I really do. Brian, by the way, with MVRPC, he, he's the man. <laughs> Who, um, some would, I think Lynn would say that Brian knew everyone at the, um, uh, the cafe, the, the, the cafe that was recently held. Well, he <laughs> knows everybody in Miami Valley, <laughs> apparently, or at least everyone that attends the MVRPC. Uh, I am just, um, I'm impressed whenever, you know, Brian and I are together and we're at these places and just the relationships that you seem to have with all these folks from, from all over the place. And I really appreciate the work that you do. So thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Sure. And uh, yeah, I appreciated that you, uh, your first meeting, like mentioned that we were partners. So yeah, yeah that was, uh, <laughs> that was yeah. fun. It was, and we are. Yes, I yes. said it. <laughs> Brian and I are partners. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for every, everyone for that. Future agenda items. Um, I can't recall anything that came up in the meetings. We're adding the American 250 yep. resolution. Mm -hmm. you, maybe the award for the leaders. Uh, we may have an ordinance for text amendments regarding bike parking, and then we're adding that storm response update. And then, Johnny, can you explain a little bit more about like what the thinking is on the inclusionary zoning thing? So, because I guess I thought we were discussing, you know, having planning commission talk about it. But then I, I see there's something about like a report or whatever. So what's the thinking about like? Right now we have Meg doing a report and okay. then we will get it sent out to council uh, the week of the 8th to see if that's something that you want the planning commission to look at after Meg does her report and brings it to council. So the idea is like kind of a preliminary Correct. like scoping kind of thing. Okay, cool. But I mean, I, I guess my initial thought had been that, you know, it would need to be like an extra thing on Meg's plate, but if you guys feel comfortable with that, I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm good with that. I, I, I think Meg's going to do the report. She'll get it sent out uh, okay. April 8th is what we have uh, slotted for, and then we'll get it sent out to council for any questions and feedback, and then she will have the full report for the second meeting in uh, April. Cool. And I will say, like, related to that, I do appreciate that, you know, just saying, like, planning commission looks at this doesn't mean there's no work to be done mm -hmm. or whatever. So, so anyway, so I, I want to recognize that as well. So I like that approach. If that's comfortable with everyone so yeah and and so at our last meeting um, we talked about the the, the rules the council rules our uh, our process for bringing stuff to the to the to the dais and whatnot um, I'm gonna um, take responsibility for that not being in in this uh, week's packet um, I, Transparency. When I mentioned old business, and there was nothing there, I I played around with saying something. But this is what I was thinking about that that item a, as a discussion for us would have been there had I uh, uh, completed my homework. 
Um, and and so I'm taking responsibility for that. So I'd like to, uh, and, and so for those who have not submitted any ideas for changes, um, let's, uh, We'll give you a couple more days to get those in, but I've got some things. Uh, Gavin's shared a, a, a great deal. Um, so, Judy, maybe we could put that um, discussion um, under old business for our next meeting. Yeah, we'll talk about it in agenda planning. Okay. Begin, getting fairly lengthy, and maybe there's okay. something we can pull off. So, no. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thing for the good of the order. All right. Hearing uh, nothing, uh, the chair will um, accept a. Well, I saw some motion over here. <laughs> You're describing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, I'm not allowed. <laughs> if I were. I thought it was that. <laughs> all right. I'll entertain a, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is Second. there? All right. We all in favor? Please uh, indicate us hand. All right. Yeah. What, right. uh, what does, uh, 